Hello and welcome to another presentation for literature class. Today we're going to study symbolism. First we have to discuss what is a symbol. You know, these, these things called symbols are found in short stories, novels, poetry, drama, and other literary and artistic forms. And for this presentation the concepts are going to be discussed in relation to a poem primarily. But what is a symbol? A symbol is something that stands for something, that represents another thing. I mean, in, in my Intro to Literature textbook, um, I see that the glossary has defined a symbol as a person, place, or thing, or event that figuratively represents or stands for something else. Often the thing or idea represented is more abstract and general, and the symbol is more concrete and particular. A traditional symbol is one that frequently reoccurs in and beyond literature and is thus immediately recognizable for those who belong to a given culture. In Western culture, or literature and culture, for example, the rose and the snake traditionally symbolize love and evil, respectively. Other symbols, such as the scarlet letter and Hawthorne's the scarlet letter, instead accrue their complex meanings only within a particular literary work, and these are sometimes called invented symbols. So that, that gives you a really good scope of how, um, you know, symbols are, are uh, what, the, what the definition actually is of a symbol. Um, let's break it down even more simplistically, and here I'll return to the screen. <clears throat> symbols have both literal and figurative meanings. So the literal meaning is, is the actual meaning of the item. So something that you would actually possibly find in a dictionary, the, the literal meaning of that item. The figurative meaning is the representative meaning of, of the item. And so that's the one that is going to be the larger portion of the definition um, if you were to study it or write a paper or discussion posting on that. Um, let's just take an example of the American flag. Well, if we back off and just use the noun flag, literally a flag is just a piece of cloth used to signal someone. If we put a country in front of it, then we can see that uh, particular comfort country represented in the colors and the style of the flag, the, the images and um, colors or striping or whatever's on that flag, that that represents that particular country. Um, so that is a form actually of a representation, but when we talk about an American flag, literally it's the stars and stripes, red, white, and blue, I'll put on that flag in order to represent that country. <clears throat> However, the American flag itself has a bigger meaning, a more figurative meaning. It stands for freedom. And so if you see that, then immediately you start thinking of all, all of the principles of, of America that come along with that flag. Let's take another example that you all would be familiar with, um, a, web, a wedding band. You know, technically a wedding band is just a ring. The literal meaning of a ring or this band is that it's a decorative jewelry, de decorative piece of jewelry, usually made of a precious metal, such as silver or gold. And it's worn on the ring finger. And because it's on the ring finger, that gives it this representation that is significant. <clears throat> so figuratively, the wedding band stands for a marriage, a partnership, or a commitment between two other people. So it has a greater meaning than just being something of value on a finger or something pretty to decorate a finger. Um, it represents something bigger for a particular couple. <clears throat> and we have some more types of symbols. You heard in the definition um, about a traditional symbol as well as an invented symbol. Um, so we're going to add a little bit to that that's not in your book necessarily. Um, there's, there are a couple of types of symbols called natural and conventional symbols, and this should be pretty easy to remember if you pair them, uh, because natural symbols are made by nature. So, um, and, and then conventional symbols are made by man. We also have a concept called open symbols and closed symbols. An open symbol would have more than one meaning, whereas a closed symbol would have pretty much or it would have only one meaning. And this is where we kind of slice and dice and dissect the definition of what we're actually studying a little bit more. I mean, it's, you know, even with natural and conventional symbols, um, most of those are pretty clear cut. 
um, but we often have our symbols meaning more than just one basic meaning. Most symbols represent uh, more than one meaning. So. Identifying symbols. Sometimes that can be a little tricky for people, um, but as you're reading, you want to look everywhere throughout that work for um, symbols. Look in the beginning. Usually they're given quick and early, or at least a clue, maybe a color, maybe um, a general reference to that symbol is offered, or maybe the symbol itself is named and then you get hints of it later on throughout the work. So look everywhere throughout throughout the work, but I'm sure you're going to find it pretty early on in the work. Um, they are going to be repeated, repeated often, maybe not literally by that one uh, simple term, but another form of it will appear throughout the text. The symbol, um, a, a really well integrated symbol, pro probably has meaning outside of the work itself. However, when you study most literary theory or modern literary theory, um, the symbol has to be significant within the work itself. And so if you took that symbol outside of that work, um, would it necessarily have the same meaning or not? Or is it so well integrated into that story or poem or work period that um, it, it works without the context of the story? Um, most symbols that you are going to identify will be extremely significant only to that text. <clears throat> The symbol's meaning is deep and provides insight to the story, character, speaker of the poem, narrator, whomever. Um, often, symbols are put in there to add to a characterization. So, for example, in Zora Neale Hurston's Sweat, it's one of my favorite short stories of all time, Sykes, who is the antagonist to Delia, who is the protagonist, she is our heroine in the work, um, <clears throat> he is often associated with a snake. And so Sykes, snake, you know, kind of sounds similar. It's, there's an alliterative property there. Um, and so when you think of him and you start thinking about, you know, and what he actually does to her, um, that symbol not, it doesn't just become kind of a representation of him, but it becomes kind of a literal representation in, in the story too. Um, but snake evil that, you know, we heard that in the definition. That's pretty much a universal um, symbol uh, for evil. And Sykes, um, while we may, well, yeah, we can say, I would probably consider him evil. <laughs> at, at first glance, you might just say he is just a jerk and he's looking to get out of his relationship. He's cheating on Delia anyway. And by the end of it, though, um, very few readers have sympathy for Sykes and what happens to him. So the final point here on identifying a symbol <clears throat> is that the symbol often holds more than one meaning. Now we learned on the last slide that we have symbols that are open and some that are closed, uh, but, but a symbol that has more than one meaning would be open and often those uh, add to the complexity of the plot and the characters as the, the story progresses too. So don't be shocked if a lot of the symbols that you locate in the works have more than one true meaning. Analysis of a symbol. Um, when, you, when you are actually writing about symbol, whether it's in a journal entry, a discussion posting, a paper, um, an exam question, you should take it piece by piece and make sure that you have each part of the definition named. And let me add too, I didn't cover traditional formally in this presentation because I'm adding to your understanding of the book. Um, in the book they, they discuss the traditional symbol and then also um, the invented symbols. I would add those to this list here. So make sure that you're defining a symbol literally and figuratively, naturally and conventionally, stating whether that thing is open or closed, and then specifically tracing the symbol throughout the text. You know, if you are marking the, sim the symbol and stating exactly where the symbol begins in the text and then its next sighting and the next sighting, and you're tracing that, that would write, make for a really good paper topic. Um, you can quote it, you can paraphrase it, 
you could just name, you know, um, the, the, the part, just describe the part where it's located in the text, but tracing that symbol throughout and naming the spots where it's, where it's offered can help you write how that symbol either changes or transitions as it's used um, throughout the story and how it changes in accordance with the character that it that it belongs with or with that part of the just with that part of the story period. What does the symbol reveal about the story poem or work? That is one of the final things that actually adds into the analysis factor of writing about a symbol or about defining a symbol. <clears throat> so what deeper meaning does that symbol provide overall to the work is what you would want to discuss. And it never hurts, you know, marking the text, offering, you know, a <clears throat> the page number, the, the line um, gives a, an example. And that is one thing that I'd like to say about those last two bullet points on here is being able to give the examples will make the other parts more clear. You don't just state the symbol is, symbol's literal meaning is blah, 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 and leave this, the entire rest of the definition alone. Giving an example um, is, is what we're getting at with the last couple of, of bullet points. Well, let's go on ahead and analyze a symbol. This happens to be one of my favorite poems, and uh, One Perfect Rose by Dorothy Parker. She has a great sense of humor, my opinion, many people's opinions. So let me just read the, the work aloud to you, and then we'll talk about its meaning. <clears throat> One Perfect Rose by Dorothy Parker. A single flower he sent me since we met. All tenderly his messenger he chose. Deep-hearted, pure, with scented dew still wet, one perfect rose. I knew the language of the floweret. My fragile leaves, it says, his heart enclose. Love long has taken for its amulet, one perfect rose. Why is it no one ever sent me, yet one perfect limousine, do you suppose? Ah, no, it's always just my luck to get one perfect rose. So you could probably tell by the, not just the words in the poem, but also the inflection that I used as I was reading it, that one perfect rose changes. It's kind of exciting and eager in that first stanza. And then in the second one, it's love long has taken for his amulet. Love long has taken for its amulet. Um, he's not choosing a, a, a symbol of his love that is unique. He, it, his choice is very common. Okay, um, And then finally, of course, she sped up with the rose. <laughs> the concept of that, oh, no, it's always just my luck. So if we analyze it in accordance with all of these um, pieces put together. Okay, the, the symbol, if you couldn't guess, <laughs> by the title and by the repetition throughout um, is the rose and one perfect rose. You could actually look at that entire phrase and analyze it. Um, but I'm just going to choose to use the word rose. <clears throat> Literally, a rose is a popular flower. It has petals that are in these beautiful rings just folded into one another. The stems have thorns, so that makes them kind of a bittersweet type of um, uh, gift to a person. But boy, that fragrance, that pleasant scent, oh my goodness, that is just so wonderful. I, I, I do love roses. I don't enjoy getting them. I kind of feel the way Dorothy Parker does about them, but <laughs> I like the scent. I think they're gorgeous. I like to grow them in my garden, but not receive them necessarily. Although I would never turn one down. All right, so... Now that we've established that I'm not quite as surface as um, this poem, the speaker in the poem reveals herself to be, um, the figurative meaning. Let's look at this. So what does this represent? What does this rose represent? And so I kind of discussed that just by tracing it through each stanza a second ago. Um, for the man, the rose represents his love. And it's a traditional symbol of love across many cultures. In fact, so much so that, you know, most women enjoy get, getting roses. It's, it's, a, 
it's exciting, you know, when you get one or two or a dozen, however many come, you know, it's kind of exciting. Giving a rose is meant to be a gesture of kindness that the person um, is thinking about that per that other lover, that other person um, beyond just seeing each other. And, it, and it's a gift to another human being. For the woman, though, the rose, or the woman in this poem, I should say, the speaker in the poem, this rose represents a cliche. And it's possibly a waste of time and effort on this man's part in giving it to her. It might reveal that while he is thoughtful, she is doubtful of actually staying with him or doubts his choice in his messenger, as she puts it, and wishes either for something more unique, something more um something of more expense or original. So could we say that the rose actually represents or shows how shallow she is? No, well, we could write a paper about that. We could also look at it as she's doubting the relationship on a deeper level and it's really questioning whether she should be in it. Um, if he can't provide for her something better than one perfect rose, then why is she with him? Is there going to be any promise of a future? You can, you can look at it a little more intensely or a little more deep in that manner. Now, if we define the type, whether it's natural or conventional, we're going to say that this particular one is natural. And while men cultivate roses, um, you know, they, they enhance their beauty and their color and their scent. Um, nature is the Thing that created the rose and without nature and creating it originally um, it's, would we have it so definitely a natural uh, type here is it open or closed well with as much as this particular one changes throughout each stanza and even if you're looking at the title you know this this thing has three different meanings or four different meanings by the time that you finish so um, you know, something something of love and that she appreciates that he's given for love. And then it kind of short, uh, kind of changes in its meaning by the time that she's finished with the poem. So we would have to say that this particular symbol is, um, is open. It has multiple meanings. And this one would definitely be an example of a traditional symbol rather than an invented one. Although I think you could argue either point, um, just like, you know, natural or conventional that man cultivates the rose. Um, I think it would definitely side with natural as well as a traditional symbol because a rose, not just in American culture, but in many cultures around the world, um, is a symbol of love to another person. So that concludes our study of symbolism. If you have any questions, just make sure that you email or post them online. I'd be happy to hear them.